Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I thank you, Lord, for what's going on here. Uh, thank you for uh, folks that, that serve in, in this church, in ministry, and, and in other ways. Um, we praise you, Lord, for your goodness to us and your blessings upon us. We pray that you'll bless your word as we read it, as we study it. Help me as I preach to, to do so in, in the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start right away uh, tonight just with the passage that we were in uh, this morning where I preached half the message and, and uh, we'll just pick right up where we left off um, in Matthew chapter 16 and just read the passage. And we, uh, we've been singing an hour more in choir practice before the service. Um, uh, maybe I will be shorter. I'm, I'm a little hoarse, it sounds like, I think. And that's all right. All right. Um, Matthew chapter 16, begin, beginning in verse 13, when Jesus came uh, into the coast of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said... Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And they also... For and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and, whoso and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now this morning, as we looked at this passage of scripture, and... Uh, we, we looked at, especially verse 16, really just centered in on it, Peter's great confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when, when uh, Jesus got that confession out of Peter, uh, he, said, he said, I'm going to build my church on this. And so we're talking about the church that Christ built. The foundation is Christ. And we have to anchor our church upon the identity and mission of Christ. That's, that's how we know that we're on the foundation of Christ. When we anchor on the identity and the mission of Christ. And so, uh, now we kind of hammered that point a little bit this morning. And I want to I talk about why we must do that. What are the benefits? What, what happens when we do that? So we want to identify with Christ, his, his identity, his mission. So we, why do we do that? Well, identify with Christ so he will build our church. So that so Jesus himself will build our church. Again, in, in Jesus says here um, in, in verse uh, <clears throat> 18, he said, um, upon this rock, you guys can build my church. No. He said, upon this rock, my church will be built. No. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter spoke for all the disciples when he, when he declared Jesus to be the Messiah and the Son of God. He was, he was speaking for the group. And Jesus at that point heard exactly what he wanted to hear. Sometimes he would coax some things out of them till he heard them say what he wanted them to, what he wanted them to say. Uh, and so immediately just a blessing springs out of his lips. I mean, verse 17, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee. Uh, I, can, uh, I can imagine just an encouraged inflection in Jesus' voice. Blessed art thou, Simon. He's maybe not amazed because he knows everything, but he is, he is just really encouraged that, that Simon said this. I just thought about five jokes about Simon Says, and I put them all out of my mind, all right? Um, I'm going to put those out of my mind. But he was so pleased after all of this time that after the struggles and trials that Simon and the other 11 
believed in who he was and what he had come to do. Jesus reminded Simon of who Simon was to him. And Jesus, uh, he says... Right here, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood. Or he, he goes on in verse 18, he says, Thou art Peter. Thou art Peter. Now, let's, now, now we have different types of names than, than they had in Bible times. Uh, my dad's name is David, and you don't call me Chad of David. That would, my, my last name's not of David. Uh, and... And, and uh, we, we have a first name and a last name, right? And sometimes we have a middle name. Uh, and and uh, some people go by their middle name. But uh, I find that out about some of you when I go to visit you in the hospital. I'll come and I'll say, is so-and-so here? And then, nope. <laughs> and you're there. You just go by your, I just know you by your middle name. So, uh, and we, we get it figured out. But um, anyway, uh, so Jesus says to Peter, you're Peter. Now, where do you get that name? We go back to John chapter 1, verse 42, where we read from this morning. And uh, they, they bring, Andrew, Simon's brother, brings him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Cephas is the Hebrew word for Peter. Peter is, is basically a transliteration of the term Pet, uh, Petros. All right, and it means a stone or a, a good size word. It doesn't have to be a tiny little pebble, but a stone. Um, and so Cephas and Peter, Jesus gave him that name. And so now we fast forward to this narrative here, and and Peter gives this confession: Christ is the Son of God. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And and Jesus gives. He says, "You're blessed," but he says, "You're Peter. Remember, you're the rock." You're, you're not, you, you're, you're a rock. I called you that in the beginning and you're still that to me. And uh, when Jesus, so, so he'd given, you know, when God gives someone a new name, it's a sign of great favor. God renamed Abram and gave him the name Abraham. He renamed Sarai and gave her the name Sarah. He renamed Jacob and gave him the name Israel, showing great favor uh, <clears throat> to those people, and he renamed Peter and, and gave him the name, or he renamed Simon and gave him the name Peter, all right? Someday when we get to heaven, God's going to give you a new name. He's going to give me a new name. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible says to him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save, save he that receiveth it. Uh, it's a sign of great favor that Jesus says to Simon, you're Peter. He's, he's just super blessed. Jesus is blessed That's what, about what Simon said, and he's blessing him back. And, and so uh, he couldn't help himself uh, but bless him. He says, you are a rock. Uh, and I called you that in the beginning. Don't forget it. Jesus says nothing by accident, though. And Peter's nickname here is, is a segue into a bigger teaching, uh, a, a sound theological truth uh, in the issue at hand. So he says, Simon, you're a rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, people wonder, did he tell Peter that he's going to build the church on Peter? That's what the Catholic Church teaches, that, that here Peter became the Pope. Now let me tell you why Peter didn't become the Pope. In a couple of verses, Jesus is going to say to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. So if he's the Pope and the Pope is infallible, shoot, he, he's Satan. So the Pope is Satan right there. Anyway, maybe we can hold on to that. But um, And so... Uh, he didn't make Peter the Pope right here. A little while later, uh, James and John are to be arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, they're all standing here, and if Jesus says to Peter, you're the Pope and you're in charge, they're not going to be arguing later on about who's, who's the most important and who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and so he doesn't, he, he's not saying to Peter, I'm going to build my church on you. Because he uses the term Petros, that's Peter. And then he says, on this rock, that's Petra. 
And it's a totally different term. Perhaps you've seen uh, pictures of the, of the carved out Edomite fortress in Seir in the Middle East. Uh, it's, it's very famous. It's on Indiana Jones, if you <laughs> want a reference, all right? Uh, it's there, there, but there's a big temple and several buildings carved into the rock, and that is actually called Petra. That's the name of the place, and, and it's called Petra because it's just a big rock, all right? It's made out of bedrock. The term Petra, uh, the term Petros means a stone. The term Petra means bedrock. It means huge, solid rock. Um, and Josephus used the term Petra to describe great fitted stones that were at the base of the towers of Jerusalem and in the temple. And so Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. What was the rock? Well, the rock was not Peter. So what was it? Well, let's look in context here, all right? And Peter says... Um, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now all we know from reading that, all we know is what Peter said. Some people, uh, uh, some many people and I don't think this really even changes the interpretation, the final application of the, of the text anyway. But a lot of people imagine that Jesus is saying, you're Peter, and upon this rock, Jesus doing this, upon this rock I will build my church. He's pointing to himself, and maybe he did, but we don't know that because it doesn't say it. All right? And so I want you to understand, in context, uh, Jesus is talking about what Peter just said. Because that's what we know, all right? You are Peter, your little rock, and on this bedrock, I'm going to build my church. And so what I believe is that Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my church on the solid rock of what you just said, that confession. All right? What is, what is Peter's confession? Well, he, can, he says Jesus Christ is, or Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. All right? And so it's the identity of Jesus and the mission of Jesus that is the rock, all right? So if you would, if you would say that Jesus is building the, the church on himself, that's true, all right? <laughs> it, doesn't change that, it doesn't change that interpretation, but I think he's talking specifically about what Peter just said. And so Jesus promised that he would build his church upon himself, but more than that, he would build his church on faith, in the identity and the mission of Christ. Those who would enter the church, those, as Peter would late, later on write in the epistle of Peter, that we're lively stones, that we've come to a living stone, and we're built up a holy temple unto God, and Christ is the chief cornerstone. And Peter would write, maybe he was thinking about that when he wrote that, when he wrote in First Peter there. And so um, those of us who are in the church, who are built into it, we are built in because we have faith in the identity and the mission of Christ. This, and, and, and when we do that, and when we are that, there's a promise from God himself that he will build the church. We sing, standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. This is a promise we can stand on. Christ will build our church if we identify with him. If he is the bedrock that we found ourselves on. We don't have to look at other churches and say, well, they've got all the good stuff. Look at their programs going on. We've got to copy that. We don't, have to, we don't have to wring our hands and worry and say, I wonder how big our church is going to be this time next year. I know as a budget committee we meet and we write out a budget and we think, are we going to be making this much money next year? And there's some practical stuff to that. I'm not saying throw that out. Um, but, but we don't have to wring our hands and wonder, man, I hope we grow. I, don't, I hope we don't shrink and, and become irrelevant or something like that. Why? Because Christ will build our church. We don't have to invent some new attraction to make things snappy around here. You know, something, oh, we got to get, we got to get people in the building. No, we don't. Because people in the building is, is not building the church. That's visitors. That's great. We should have visitors. We should invite people. But that is not church growth, visitors. Church growth is people being saved and added to the church. All right. And I think a lot of times, 
uh, we, we may miss the point. And I, I think uh, in American Christianity, we've kind of gotten away from the fact that people usually get saved outside the church and come in. Uh, and and I, I've been doing a lot of soul searching on this lately, as especially we've had a couple missionaries come in and just preach uh, an emphasis on the gospel and, and witnessing to people we know. And I fall, fall, I fall far short of that. But when we all grasp the concept that, that uh, uh, we need to tell someone about Christ in the street, lead them to the Lord, and then they come into the church, then we don't have to pull some kind of circus to get people that are not saved to come in. And I, I believe that's really how it worked in the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2. Uh, Jesus, or, or Peter, stands up and preaches, and 3,000 people got saved, and the Bible says that God added them to the church, not, not the other way around. So I'm not saying people that are lost can't come and hear the gospel and be saved. That, that's great when that happens. Um, but it, it goes from outside in also. So we don't have to invent some new attraction to get people in. That doesn't mean we should do nothing to get people in. I mean, I want to invite as many people as we can to our Christmas programs. They're going to hear the gospel. Oh, any visitor that comes is going to hear the gospel, and that, that's great. So I'm not saying that, I'm not saying don't invite anybody, all right? <laughs> um, but we have, uh, we have to anchor our church on the identity and mission of Christ and claim that promise that when we do that, he will build our church. All right? Uh, so make Peter's confession our foundation. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he will take care of the rest. I get mailers and advertisements from every type of church ministry, uh, every stripe of it, um, and, and they, they advertise, all of them advertise church growth, youth group growth, um, whatever new method for this or for that. And, and some are pretty good and some are pretty bad. And uh, but Some advertise the next new big thing, the next big new thing, and some advertise the, uh, that all things are, all new things are bad, and they're advertising the next new return to the old things, and uh, I mean, there's just all kinds of different stuff, and um, I'm sure there's a lot of good and practical things in there to learn, but most of all, we have to anchor on Christ, his identity, and his mission is the gospel, his mission is uh, to seek and to save that is, which is lost, and then he will build our church. Sunday school teachers, teach your class the identity and mission of Christ. Focus on Christ, not on Sunday school growth. Uh, husbands, lead your homes to know and to follow the identity and the mission of Jesus Christ. Parents, teach your children and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And teach them the identity and mission of Christ. Let's sing songs that praise Christ for who He is and what He has done. Let's base our fellowship on the same. Let's preach sermons that flow from the identity and mission of Christ. Let's go out on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and come back again on Sunday, living the identity and mission of Jesus Christ. If we do this, He has promised I'll build your church, or he'll build his church. <laughs> we call it ours. It's ours. It's his, but it's ours too. You know what I'm saying? Um, he'll build it. In North Carolina, we had an above-ground pool in our backyard, and I wanted to put a deck on it. Um, and I had a friend who had a pool very similar to ours, same shape and size, and he was good at working with his hands, and, and he put a deck just like the one I wanted on his pool. And so I went over to his house, and I, I got out my camera, and I took pictures uh, underneath it or all around it. And I got all these pictures uh, from all angles of his deck, and I wanted to be sure that I got uh, a deck put up just, just like that one. Do you know what my deck turned out to look like when it was finished? My deck looked just like his. You, how did I accomplish this? Did I accomplish it by taking pictures and copying his work? You guys know better than that. I accomplished this by having him come over and build it. All right? Uh, he, he was helping me, but uh, honestly, uh, uh, basically he came over and designed it, and I did manual labor, all right? And so um, the, the church can be exactly what Christ envisions if he is the one building it. It'll come out just as he wants um, if we anchor in the identity and mission of Christ, all right? 
identify with Christ so he'll build our church. That's one of the benefits. What else will he do? Well, let's identify with Christ so he will deliver our church. So he'll deliver our church. Look at verse 18. This is a great this is, this is a great promise in Scripture. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell. You know, gates are not a weapon of warfare. You never hear about an army commander giving the order to charge and saying, all right, hit the enemy line with all the gates you have. All right, there... We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna send an attack. Wheel out the gates. They're not a they're not a weapon of warfare. Gates are designed either to keep something in or keep something out. Hell here translates the Greek word Hades, which refers to the realm of the dead. It refers to death. What Jesus is saying is that death and hell, and hell as the realm of the death includes the lake of fire. But he's, what he's saying is death itself cannot triumph over the church that I build. When I'm building the church, it will not be held in death by those gates of death. It will escape. The gates of hell cannot contain the church. 1 Corinthians 15 says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, they shall be, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through the church that we built. No, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what he is saying here is, is that death can have no victory over the church that Jesus built. He delivers it. If you're not built on the foundation of the identity and mission of Christ, we have no such guarantee. The gates of hell may very well prevail against a church that is not built by Christ. For that church has no guarantee. But if it's founded on the rock of Christ, what are some signs that a church is not founded on the rock of Christ? Some, church, some signs that a church isn't anchored on that foundation is this. First of all, they de-emphasize the gospel. It's a, it's a church that doesn't bring up things... Um, doesn't like to talk necessarily about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for our sins. They, they will not call for, for repentance unto salvation. Uh, they avoid any passage of scripture that speaks about hell or judgment or any specific sin that makes us uncomfortable. The message of salvation is replaced by a, a message of a better community or a better self-esteem or purpose or completeness or a better you. And if, you, and if you listen to that too long, pretty soon you're just going to self-help self -help seminars. The gospel's been replaced. And as Paul said to the Galatians, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into, great, uh, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Um, he said also to the Corinthians, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. They don't, they, they don't emphasize the gospel. They don't submit to the authority of God's word, either by directly denying the Bible as God's word inerrant and, and undefiled, or, 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 um, or by claiming to believe the Bible as God's word, but never reading it, never studying it, never preaching it, never uh, living what it says, or, or uh, obeying it. Also, a church may refuse the authority of God's word more subtly by not emphasizing what the Bible emphasizing and then placing great emphasis where the Bible does not place great emphasis. For example, when Dr. Reichman was here, I was talking to him before the service. I don't know how we got off on this subject, but we're talking about things that can... can uh, well, he's traveled to so many churches. He, he was talking about things that have, have made it so he couldn't preach at certain churches. He was in a church in Michigan, of course. Uh, this this could only happen in Michigan. Uh, but anyway, he was wearing wire-rimmed glasses. Maybe he mentioned this. I can't remember. Uh, and the preacher would not let him preach because he was wearing wire-rimmed glasses. They were too worldly. 
because, you know, John Lennon wore wire rim glasses and the hippies wore those. And I was thinking to myself, so did Ben Franklin. But uh, anyway, um, and, and that, that actually was a thing. Now, that's been a few years ago, but... Uh, I remember, I've heard, I've heard people preach against wire rim, rim glasses. You think that's nuts? It's nuts. All right. Uh, you, know why, you know why people would preach against wire rim glasses? Because they're not emphasizing what scripture emphasizes. I mean, you can search, search the scriptures and show me the, the anti-wire rim glasses verse. All right. Uh, you can get up there, you can, you can harp on all kinds of things that are not in the Bible. All right, and so the Bible teaches separation from worldliness, but it doesn't absolutely say something about wire-rimmed glasses. Um, a church can can refuse the authority of God's word by seeking revelation from God in places other than the Bible, other than other than God's word. There's a whole slew of heaven tourism books out. There's uh, signs and wonders. People are always looking for signs in the sky, you know, uh, signs, just like the Pharisees, show us a sign from heaven uh, and, and all of that stuff. And there's, um, or, or, or maybe they have some great allegiance to a man or a movement. And I meant, if I could mention a name and, uh, and, and a name a lot of people would know, and, and you might know certainly as soon as I say the name, what every church who follows him is like. They're like him and not like Jesus. Uh, and uh, so, if we identify with Christ, we anchor to that rock, who he is and what he does, what his mission is. We have the guarantee that death has no victory over us, all right? Here's a great song. It says, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry till final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Do you know what this is? This is a song written by someone who has claimed the promise that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. This, you know why I know that? It's because the song's called In Christ Alone, not in something else. And Christ alone delivers from death and hell. So we need to anchor our church. Church membership ought to be saved people. Uh, church membership, uh, uh, by the way, church membership's important. We ought, we, ought, we, ought to be, we ought to be committed to our local assembly, but it, it ought to be saved people. It ought to be people who identify with Christ. Why? Because he's building our church. And, and, and it'll be a church delivered a church built on Christ. What happens when we identify with Christ? If we do so, He will lead our church. He'll guide it. He'll direct it. He will be the one that shows us where to go and what to do. And we don't have to wonder about that. Look at verse 19, all right? Verse 19, He says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You know, somebody will lead our church. Someone will. That somebody could be a, the preacher, or a deacon, or an influential lay person, uh, or the person with the most money, or the, the person with the most magnanimous personality. Uh, a, a leader of a movement could lead our church from outside, or somebody, though, will lead this church. If we identify with Christ, anchoring ourselves in the rock that is Christ, that somebody who leads our church will be Christ. He said, excuse me, Paul wrote in Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, which who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. A, a church with a preeminent Christ is a church with the perfect leader, the Christ-led church. I, I want you to understand, as we look at this passage in verse 19, I want you to understand what the passage is not saying before we look at what it is saying. All right? Um, here isn't 
this is just this is just a, a, a verse that's really been taken in a lot of directions, and it's difficult to to uh, to interpret. But it says, "I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, thou shalt bind in shall be bound in heaven." You know, the guy with the keys is the one that's in charge. I mean, you know, um, for instance, we I forget where we were. Maybe it was here, and my family was threatening to leave without me, but I had the car keys. I was like, you're not going too far. I'm the guy with the keys. I'm in charge. And the guy with the keys can open the door and close the door. And when Jesus says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, that's what he's talking about. All right? And that, that's been misinterpreted a lot. We, we've, heard, we've all heard jokes about heaven that start with, St. Peter was at the gate, and so-and-so came to get in, right? And that's, that's where all this comes from. But Jesus was not saying that whatever Peter says on earth must be done in heaven, as if God was bound to be his magic genie, that he was, he was the servant of the apostle. Peter was not given power to excommunicate people and take away their salvation uh, in a way in which he would have no authority to do that. Jesus does not say here that God is a, our slave in heaven and whatever we decide to do as a church, he has to do in heaven. That's not what, that's not what this Bible teaches anywhere. So, what is Jesus saying here? Right, I want you to notice two important terms. What you bind, in, what, uh, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, I want you to notice the term shall be bound. All right, it occurs twice. Shall be bound and shall and and uh, shall be loosed. All right, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Um, the way these two phrases are constructed in the Greek language is far more specific than than the way we talk in English, and. Uh, let me just give you, I want to show my homework a little bit here, all right? Uh, I, I don't like to do this much, but I think it's necessary. It's constructed, it is the future tense with the perfect passive participle, all right? Now that doesn't mean a whole lot to the average person sitting in the pew, and it really doesn't mean a whole lot to me either. I'm not a Greek wizard, but to people like A.W. Tozer and A.T. Robertson that are, that are all right? <laughs> I'm really stealing their homework. But anyway, um, what this what this constructs to mean in the English language that doesn't translate as easily as we'd like it to, uh, it means what you bind in heaven will have been loosed or will have been bound, bound in heaven. We don't say will have been, all right? But he's saying what you bind in heaven, the way this is constructed, will have been, or what you, I'm sorry, what you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And what he is saying is what took place in heaven was previous. All right? It already happened and it was bound already. What you're binding in heaven was already bound in heaven. Or what you're, sorry, what you're binding on earth uh, was already bound in heaven, shall have been bound. What you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven, has already been bound in, or has already been loosed in heaven. All right? And that is, that is key to understand. What's the point to all this? Um, the church is, on earth has these keys to heaven because it's carrying out heaven's decisions, not heaven ratifying and rubber stamping everything the church says. The church is actually the reverse. All right? And so um, when anchored in Christ... Peter is going to do things that are already designed in heaven. The church is going to act the same way. So what does it mean to bind and loose things, all right? The, the short story is this. Um, to bind something means to forbid it. To loose something means to permit it, all right? And so how is it possible here that we can, as a church, we can forbid or permit different things? Uh, how is that possible as, as a church? I'm skipping some of my notes for time, so I'm getting lost. So hang on a minute. Um, hang on. Okay, there we go. Um, so we bind and loose things on earth by preaching the gospel. Very simply, 
by showing people the kingdom gate, we are loosing. We are, we are, we are permitting to them, we are permitting to them the entrance to the kingdom. By preaching the gospel, we also forbid, we also bind, because what we're doing is we're saying anybody can come, but we're also saying lots of people aren't coming. And we're saying, we're saying, yes, we, we, we uh, loose for you the door to the kingdom of heaven, but we bind from you anything else. So if you would refuse Christ, you are bound. And if you would accept Christ, you are loosed. All right, and so it's not something where we walk around and whatever polity we decide as a church, heaven is our slave and has to enforce that. All right, otherwise God would be schizophrenic trying to do all the things that the different churches are doing. It is that there's a gospel, an eternal word in heaven, and as a church, when we are anchored on Christ, what we permit and what we what we bind and what we loose, what we permit and what we forbid is already will have been done. It's already done in heaven. And we know that the decisions we make and the path that we take is already done in heaven. Jesus prayed on earth, that your will be done on earth. How? As it is in heaven. Wouldn't this be the answer to his prayer? And so who did he give the keys to? Well, he said in Matthew chapter 18, he didn't just give the keys to Peter. And he didn't just give the power to bind and to loose on earth to Peter. He actually gives it to the church. Because in Matthew chapter 18, he's talking about church discipline. And he says in verse 18, Verily I say unto you, all the church, whosoever, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right. And following heaven's authority in these matters is following the authority of Christ himself. When we're truly following the lead of Christ, he gives us the keys. We must anchor our church in the identity and mission of Christ and he'll build our church and he will deliver our church and he will lead our church. And his, as he gives us the keys, we are waiting to throw open the kingdom to those we come in contact with to loose them and set them free. And to those who wouldn't come, well, we say Jesus is the only way. And we're doing God's will. We have, to, we have no doubt. Of, we can boldly follow that path. Let's live every moment of every day being conscious of the presence of Christ. Be ever sure of his identity and make that your identity. He, you're a child of the king. He is the child of the king. You are a child of the king. You're joint heirs with Christ. But always be on his mission, carrying with you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, ready to open that door, throw it open to give access to whoever you come in contact with Let's pray and we'll...